Today I'm fortunate enough to have Ingrid Johnson, a certified cat behavior consultant of Fundamentally Feline. Ingrid is certified through the International Association of Animal Behavior Consultants and owns and operates Fundamentally Feline, offering in-home behavior consult consultations in Atlanta and phone consults nationwide. She makes her own line of feline foraging toys, aka food puzzles, provides the services of cutting the openings to the most ideal litter box for her clients, and her husband makes their own line of 100% sisal scratching products, including scratching posts, pads, and ramps for senior cats. He also designs, hand makes, and installs custom-built vertical spaces for shelters, private homes, and most recently, Atlanta's first cat cafe, Java Cats. You can purchase the vertical space pieces on her website and install them yourself if you are not local. Ingrid is employed at Paws, Whiskers, and Claws at Feline-Only Veterinary Hospital in Marietta, Georgia as a veterinary technician, cat groomer, behavior consultant, and office manager. Ingrid has been working exclusively with cats since 1999 and has had the opportunity to attend many continuing education courses all over the country, including the first ever all-cat behavior conference ho hosted by the American Association of Feline Practitioners, the AAFP. It all came full circle when she was invited to speak at the second ever All Feline Behavior Conference that the AAFP has ever hosted in the fall of 2016. She lectures at the veterinary conferences nationwide, including the AAFP, the ACVC, which is the Atlantic Coast Veterinary Conference, the MVC, the Midwest Vet Conference, and in January 2019, the VMX, the largest veterinary conference in the world. Thank you, Ingrid, for taking the time to introduce yourself and share a little bit about what you do for kitties with us. Yeah, sure. Thank you for having me. Boy, that was a mouthful. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> not, not at all. I, I, I've always had a problem um, reading out loud. So uh, anyway, now everybody knows that. Uh, so can you please share a little bit about yourself? I know that yeah, you're absolutely. a professional cat behaviorist and run a consulting business, Fundamentally Feline. Um, which also, if, if you're listening and want to visit there, there's a corresponding Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. But how did you get into it all and why? Well, so actually it is, it is a little convoluted story. I you know, was living in an apartment complex here in Atlanta, Georgia, and I saw a cat outside my house or my apartment, and I was like, oh, I must rescue it. I must save it. And I brought it up to my vet to be spayed and, you know, vaccinated and vetted, essentially, as they say. And as I was picking up, the office manager just said to me, you want a job? I was like, oh, my God, I've always wanted to work here. And I was so <laughs> ecstatic. And I was graduating from school, um, which was actually art school, <laughs> that month. And so much to my parents' dismay, I ended up, um, I did a little working interview at the vet hospital, and I loved it, and I had to make a life decision right then and there, and so I graduated and started working at the vet hospital, um, literally, like, a, a week later. <laughs> so, wow. um, yeah, and then the family grew really fast, so I decided I was going to save the world and, you know, adopt as many cats as I could, and went a little hog wild there. Realized I couldn't save them all, so this is another really great way for me to help a lot of cats without having to have them all in my house. <laughs> yes. Well, good for you and and good for us because that that that's why we're on the phone today. That serendipitous encounter you had. Yeah, you know, it's I get to help so many more kitties when I can reach out to the masses and you know things like social media and, and getting a web presence and all of that, which of course back in the day I didn't have. It's really changed the scope of how many people I can reach and how many lives I can touch. It's it's been really phenomenal actually to see the response. Awesome. So, what does it mean to be a certified cat behavior consultant? So if, if you mean as far as like credentials or how you, you get certified, um, the IWBC, the organization that I'm certified through, has a, multiple tiers of membership and certification. So it kind of depends on how much experience you have and how far you want to go um, to get all the way to certified cat behavior consultants. You can just be a member of the group, for example, or, or be associate certified. Um, so there's different tiers, and you have a pretty rigorous 
application, um, including three case studies that I had to present. Um, I actually had a couple of months to complete my application, um, but was very pleased that it, I, I was told that it was a great application, and I was very pleased at the outcome there. Um, so it really just depends on how far you want to go with your credentials. Of course, there are you could always be a veterinarian and move on to becoming a board-certified veterinary behaviorist as well, which is obviously the cream of the crop and fanciest version of people like me. But um, what I do is go into people's homes and basically critique their home environment. Um, my goal is to help them understand why their cats are doing what they're doing, which is often environmental and often a result of what the humans have been offering them, uh, often not meeting their needs. So I help them understand why cats do what they do and why their particular cats are doing this, whatever it is that they're doing in their particular home environment, often a result of their surroundings. Um, so I, I'm not sure if that quite answers your question or not, if you wanted to know that, like how to become certified or what exactly it is that I do. Uh, more what it is that you do so that uh, people listening that might have issues know not only the importance of dealing with someone that's certified rather than right. someone that claims to be a cat behavior consultant, um, but also I wanted to kind of get into um, what are some of the reasons, like, that someone calls you and then um, maybe get in the nitty-gritty of, like, walk us through a behavior consultation. What do you do? How does it start? So that Sure, can sure. Well, I will tell you that hands down, the top two things that I get calls about um, are aggression between cats in the household, occasionally directed towards the human, but generally what we call intercat aggression, and litter box problems. Litter box problems used to be the top of the list, but aggression by far is, has definitely taken the running. Um, usually what's happening is, is families are adopting more and more cats and they're not introducing them properly. So there's a lot of intercat conflict in the home. Um, and then occasionally we do get the poorly socialized only child that um, is aggressive towards guests, visitors, or even um, other family members in the household that just are not um, their bonded person. So I get a lot of aggression and litter box issues. And for people that need my help or want my help, I actually have them start by completing a very extensive eight-page long behavior questionnaire. And what that does is it gives me that insight into the dynamics of their home environment, their day-to-day -day routine, how many cats they have, how many litter boxes they have, you know, how they feed them, what they feed them, where they feed them, all types of little particulars. It's very extensive. It asks about their grooming behavior and their play behavior, their day-to-day -day social behavior. I ask for a diagram of the home if I'm not going to be doing a house call. And I also ask for video so that if um, I'm doing a phone consult around the country, I want to feel like I'm there because so much about this, like I mentioned earlier, is about the home environment and addressing the needs of the cat and how they're being met in the home. So video by far is super helpful now. Um, you know, I didn't have that as an option back in the day, so I used to just take the home diagram and roll with it, but video is very helpful. And then once they submit that, I call the families to set up a time for a consult. Uh, home visits with me, I'm usually with most families for about two hours. And that's just pretty average. An hour and a half is kind of quick. And three hours, <laughs> I think I leave people like deer in headlights by that time. They cannot absorb any more information. Um, so when I get to the home, we take a tour. I want to see where food, water, and litter is. I want to see points of conflict in the home if there's aggression problems. I want to see all the places that they're eliminating, eliminating and, and soiling in the house so that I can get an appreciation for, you know, what's really going on. Okay. It, it makes sense to me only because I have watched multiple episodes of Psycho Kitty and My Cat from Hell, and that's, um, yeah. you know, watching those have, have – made me understand the importance of being able to see I'm all kind of just of Atlanta's version of that, you know? <laughs> yes, good. I'm glad. Yeah. We need more versions of that, though. There's, there's not enough of me or people like Pam or Jackson or any of us to go around, you know? I, um, a, lot, right. a lot more dog trainers. <laughs> I wholeheartedly agree, given the emails that I get. So, yes. Uh, and hopefully this phone 
interview will inspire someone that's thinking about it to, to start something too, um, just to help more kids. Yeah, that would be cool. I mean, I get, I get the occasional, like, fun, hey, I just adopted two kittens. I want to learn how to be the best cat parent I can be consult. Those consults are a lot of fun. Oh, and, gosh, yes. I mean, a preventative care, oh, I just want to learn more about cats and basically have a little personalized cat class in my living room. That's great, but sadly, that's not the majority of the people that I'm helping. Right, right. So you mentioned that the two biggest uh, problems that you encounter are elimination issues. Well, that's the secondary one, but the first, the primary one was inner cat aggression. Are yeah. there standard solutions, or do those solutions just are, are subjective based on what you encounter in the home? So the answer to that is a little bit of a combination, because there are standard ways of introducing cats to other cats, and that is one sense at a time. And slowly, over a period of days, weeks, and sometimes even months, and that's what humans, most of them, do not seem to understand, is that it's it's not normal for a cat to welcome a strange cat into their environment. It's actually one of the most stressful things that they can experience, moving and the introduction of a newcomer, a new cat. So we humans tend to do introductions way too quickly, if we do any at all. I mean, a lot of times these cats are just plunked down in the living room in their cat carrier and let loose. Terrifying for the new cat, terrifying for the existing cats. Right. So there is a proper introduction plan, um, but we have to modify that plan based on those individuals and how they're accepting the exercises. For example, if we're trying to use positive reinforcement and one of them loves to eat, but the other one won't take any special treats or snacks, well, maybe that cat's going to get played with. Maybe that cat's going to get brushed. That cat, we've got to be able to find something positive that each party enjoys that they can start to associate each other with something good but it's not going to be the same for every individual. And yeah, to that point, again, the process is the same and very similar, but some cats we might be able to introduce them in a week and other cats it might take five months. Okay. So we have to modify those standards based on how it's going with all those particular individuals. Got it. And you just assess that based on what you observe. Most of it is based on what the client's feedback, what they send to me, what they tell me. So, you know, they fill out their questionnaire, I come to the house with a plan, I walk them through the basic plan, and I'm like, okay, well, if you hit this roadblock or this roadblock, move to this step. And eventually they send me an update via email or we have another phone conversation and they say, okay, this, this, and this are going really well. This is not working. What do we do? And so that's where I modify it. And, um, you know, I, I try not to necessarily overwhelm them with every little tiny nuance that they might not ever need to know because right. their cats might introduce beautifully and they might not need to know every single hiccup in the road that's going to come along. But as they communicate back with me, I help tweak and modify their plan. And sometimes that plan involves behavior modification supplements or medications from their veterinarian. There's all different types of things that we have to employ, but we try very hard not to use drugs if we don't need them. They're a last resort. Okay. So what are some enrichment ideas that you provide to clients? I mean, a after the introduction and process, I assume that to keep that inner cat aggression, um, you've got to provide enrichment ideas, for, especially for indoor cats. Absolutely. And, you know, the, even the, the, the concept of the term environmental enrichment is actually starting to shift, and I'm trying to start to shift it as so I wanted to address it here, is that a lot of what we're considering environmental enrichment for our cats are really environmental necessities. And a lot of the things that we provide that have previously been called enrichment, things like interactive play, scratching posts, food puzzle toys, are really just things that are required if you're going to be a good cat parent and you're going to take good care of your cat. Um, these aren't necessarily ancillary things. Um, but for a lot of people, they are still new concepts. So, for example, I'm a big advocate of having cats work for their food. In fact, I think it's probably the most overlooked form of enrichment for indoor cats is helping them have a way to hunt and problem solve 
they need to be challenged, and food puzzles give them a little something to be like, huh, how am I going to get this out of there? And they bat it around, and then boom, they get rewarded with kibble. So it provides what we call positive frustration. They're rewarded every time they figure out the frustrating puzzle, and it becomes very self-fulfilling to forage because it's, they get food, so it's a fun activity. And you have a lot less time to engage in negative behaviors like digging in the kitchen cabinets and swinging from the drapes and beating up your housemate if you have to figure out how you're going to eat. Right. So I think it's a great time occupier, and it's a great way to entertain bored cats that are alone most of the day as well. Um, so I'm a big advocate for foraging toys and food puzzles. Um, I really can't emphasize that enough. But I think it's also really, really important that we are playing with our cats. And so many people, I cannot tell you how many people complete the behavior questionnaire, and under the section under play, they'll say, well, I pet them. Or, you know, they have toys lay laying around the house, but they don't actually pick up those wand toys and engage them. And those interactive toys are a huge key towards your cat's happiness. Interactive play relieves stress, and it also builds confidence, particularly in shy cats that maybe are a little meek in a certain room of the house. Well, play with them in that room. Build their confidence. Make them a killer, a hunter in that room, and they'll feel more powerful when they're in there. So it can change their perception of spaces to giving them a, a more bold outlook on the, on the environment. So interactive play, I think, is a really, really big aspect of cat care that is just not happening enough, particularly because as they get older, they don't entertain us like kittens do. Right. And that's not, you know, that's not a reason to not play with your cats. That adult right. cat, their ears are forward, their pupils are dilated, they're watching, they're watching, they're watching. They're strategizing. They're planning their attack. But they're not leaping through the air like a little kitten. So we, we adult humans tend to go, oh, this is boring. But not for the cat. The cat needs right. that. Okay. So... I'm, Sorry, what? I was just going to say that I'm also a really big advocate of um, vertical space and um, lots of scratching surfaces so the cats are set up for success. Um, we tend to put scratching posts in, you know, guest bedrooms where people spend no time, and that's not where cats want to scratch. Right. Cats want to scratch in high traffic pathways where you and they pass through each day. So when people are frustrated that their cats are scratching on the side of their armchair, that's because that is a very socially significant place for that cat to leave their messages behind. Think of it like they're texting. <laughs> they're leaving little kitty text messages behind. <laughs> and um, they need to be able to say it in places where it's important for them. So we need to place our scratching posts in prominent places in the home. And when we have multiple cats, we need to have lots of resources throughout the house so that they don't have to compete and that means oftentimes in small spaces, like in the metro Atlanta area here, vertical space so that the cats can get up and away from the other cats and not have all that conflict on one level. Okay. And do you have a, a preferred material for scratching, like sisal cardboard? It's really what the cats prefer. When you have a multiple cat home, it's really recommended to have multiple substrates. Now, many, many, many cats love sisal, and sisal is the medium that we work with with the scratching posts that we make. But that doesn't mean that that's the only substrate you should offer your cats. And I know that seems like a terrible selling point, but I'm not out to sell scratching posts. I'm out to keep cats' claws on, um, keep their toes on. So I just want them to have what they want. And if that's natural wood, if that's wood with tree bark still on it, if that's sisal rope, sisal carpet, corrugated cardboard, Whatever works. I had somebody whose cat loved to scratch denim and would always scratch her jeans on the floor. She took mm -hmm. an old pair of jeans, wrapped them around a 4 by 4 her cat tore up that scratching post. <laughs> so That's whatever awesome. the cats want. Yes. It's all about giving cats choice. You know, we have to remember that they're individual personalities and they're all individuals. And so what works for one may not work for all of them. And right. I mean, it's just like us. Yes, agreed. 
So you mentioned when we were setting up this interview, um, you wanted to talk about the best way to provide for a multi-cat home, and obviously you've included some of that. Um, but you also had written about clicker training, cat strollers, and catios. So wanted to mm-hmm. ask for some insight on that. Well, and and I would love to answer that, but I was just thinking that I didn't yeah. completely address the multi-cat home to the fullest extent. So I guess I will also say that. One super stressful thing that we humans tend to do to our cats is we make them all eat together. And cats are not family-style eaters. They hunt and eat alone. And no matter how well your cats get along, and no matter even if they're all litter mates and the best of friends, lining them all up in a row in the kitchen to eat is incredibly stressful to your cats because that is not how cats eat. So spread it out. Make sure that you have feeding stations throughout the house rather than creating um, one big meal time in one room. That's super stressful. And then that rule of thumb goes for all of their resources, including water and litter. And we want to spread out our litter boxes so that, you know, if you've got five cats and you've got ten litter boxes for them, but they're all in one room, to your cat that's just one big litter box. And I think from the human perspective, we have a really hard time wrapping our head around that and the fact that we've got to spread out these litter boxes so the cats can mark and communicate in the places where they feel safe going to the bathroom. So that's the end of my multi-cat environment. Okay, Um, well, we didn't actually get into the the elimination behavior issues, and it it sounds like obviously one of the solutions that you suggest is to have um, multiple litter box stations, if you will. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. It's, it's huge. Um, I, I see many, many homes where they have four or five litter boxes in one area. Right. And that's just one box. So it's really important that we spread them out and that they're big. One and a half times the length of your cat is how big your litter box should be. And they should not have covers on them because 90% of cats do not want to go in a cave-like environment to go to the bathroom. So you might have a shy eliminator, and you can offer a hooded box as an option, but it should never be the only choice in the house. Cats are very vulnerable when they eliminate, so they have to feel safe and secure and be able to see what's going on around them. That's why I provide the service for my local Atlanta clients of cutting the opening to the large clear storage tote boxes. But for everyone listening that is not in Atlanta, who I cannot physically help, I have a DIY video on my YouTube channel, and you can totally watch and make your own awesome litter box by watching that video. Okay, and, and I will happen. link to that when I um, post the interview. So the, the, this sure. interview is going to be t- transcribed, so I'll embed the vi- video and the transcription post on the site as well so people don't have to go searching for it. It should be right there for them. Cool, yeah. It's, it's very handy, and um, you probably don't even need to watch the whole thing. You can get the gist. I cut three boxes on the video, and... Um, I've cut thousands of them over the years, and I'm just trying to put a lot of free help out there for people. There's a lot of information on my site. If you just read and apply or watch and apply, a lot of times you can help yourself without ever having to contact me. That's very generous Um, of you, and I will include a link to your website, of course, as well. Thanks. Um, Um, But on the the fun note of catios, I didn't – would you like me to expand on that? (laughs) Um, yes, but before we go into that, more on the litter box situation. Sure. Um, I know that you just said if you have five cats and you've got ten litter boxes, um, is that your standard two boxes per cat, or what, how do you – Well, and this, the yeah. size of the home, I would imagine, a 1,600-square-foot home compared to a 4,800-square-foot home matters how many boxes you have, two or no? Well, it's really based on the number of cats, not so much the square footage of the space. Okay. And the general rule of thumb, and this is you know, published through a, a lot of different organizations, but the AAFP has guidelines, litter box protocol guidelines, and the recommended um, guidelines say that the boxes should be one and a half times the length of the cat's body, and there should be one more litter box than there are physical cats in the home. And I always change and rephrase that to say that there should be one more litter box location then there are physical cats in the home. So if you have five cats, ideally you should have six completely separate litter boxes and six completely different areas. Um, And the reason for that is then the cats cannot do what's called resource guarding. So they cannot 
you know, one, one bully cat cannot possibly be in six places at one time. Right. So whoever that victim might be in the house, they're generally going to always be able to get to a litter box. Um, but, you know, one of the things I talk about in my lectures is that, you know, we really need to stop thinking about them as these gross, horrible places. We need to keep them pristine. We need to keep them as clean as our human toilet. We need to scoop them every day, if not twice a day. If you have lots of big boxes, they stay cleaner longer, and you also have less odor and mess concentrated in one area. Litter box rooms are horrific, dusty, nasty places to be. The cats don't want to be in there. You don't want to be in there. So it's much better to heather things throughout the home environment for the cats, all of their resources, really, rather than concentrate them in one space. And... I just am I'm trying to encourage people to, to be the change that we need to see for cats and keep these boxes pristine and have litter boxes you can be proud of. I have a 1,250-square-foot home in downtown Atlanta. At my maximum, I had 13 litter boxes in my house. That's when I was in magazines and filmed for TV. It was not gross. I would host Thanksgiving dinner and had a baby shower in my house with all of those cats and all of those litter boxes. So you can do it, and it can be very clean. Um, but you have to actually wash them and clean them. <laughs> That's what a lot of people just don't do. Um, right. And those, you know, the, the automatic boxes and the litter robots and the litter maid and all that stuff, the, the tidy cat breeze system, all that stuff keeps me in a job. It's contraption-y, and the cats don't want to use it. And it scares them. They're too small. They don't get washed out enough. The litter robot where the, the bottom is the top and the top is the bottom, I mean, that's gross. The cats don't want to get in there and rub their body up against the body wall of, of the litter box that had pee and poop on it earlier before it spun around. It's yucky. You know, they're very clean animals. So we do a lot of things to hide the litter boxes and put them behind cat doors and in closets and just have a nice, clean, big litter box in a prominent place and keep it scooped. I felt the same way about automatic litter boxes for a long time, and I reviewed the litter robot, and we have one now. Um, and I've changed my tune about it only because um, of my personal experience with it. But I do know that it can get gross if you don't keep it clean. Um, but I've learned it's so important for folks that, um, you know, like a, a firefighter, for example, who is gone for 48 hours and can't scoop the litter box or someone that's disabled that can't get the litter box scooped. And so I think that they do have a place, but you have to be cognizant. Again, looking at your cat and seeing them as an individual, seeing them as like what works in your life, your lifestyle. I had a blind person contact me because they needed a solution because they couldn't, you know, keep their cat's litter box clean except for the person that came by once, once a week. So right. I, and I, I think that if you're going to have something there. like that, you know, you should always have a traditional box as well. Because yeah. the other thing about the automatic boxes, now, of course, for the blind person, it might not factor in so much, but we take away very vital information that we need to know. And we need to know how big are those urine clumps? Are they small? Are they huge? Are they normal? Right. How many urine clumps are there? And what's the consistency of the stool? You know, what goes in our cats and what comes out the other end are really big indicators of our cat's health. Yes. And when we take that information away, you know, we lose a lot of um, early signs that something might be wrong. Yes. I, so if we're going to have an automatic it. box, I just always recommend having a regular one as well. Okay. Give them choice. Right. All right. Well, so moving on to catios. Yeah. <laughs> well, what I, is um, a catio? I know what a catio is, but maybe share with the the listeners what a catio is. So a, a catio is different than an outdoor enclosure because a, a catio is meant and designed to be a space that you can enjoy with your cats and ideally be also a place that is not like a screen porch. You know, it's going to be actually exposed to the elements. There's generally no roof. The roof is generally screened or chicken wired in so that 
the cats can experience snow and rain and leaves and sunshine and whatever the case may be. It basically brings you and they closer to nature, um, but with, um, you know, not like taking them out into the yard, locking them in this pen in the backyard, and then they're stuck there. Right. Catios generally uh, adjoin to the house in some way, and the cats can kind of come and go as they please, but also, again, have a sitting space for the humans to enjoy as well. So in our particular home, and you actually can view um, the building of our catio, I have an album on my Facebook page um, that's all about how we built our catio, and it's, it's actually, there's some pretty crazy funny pictures in there, so... <laughs> um, we were very, very hot and tired in July in Atlanta, so it was pretty terrible. <laughs> um, but it was a very fun project. And, you know, you can have a grass floor, you can have a stone floor, you could do uh, flagstones or gravel, um, whatever the case may be, whatever you want to offer your cats as far as a substrate. But it's, it's nice for them to be able to experience some textures and some smells that they wouldn't if they are indoor only. And I also love to encourage people who have screen porches or catios to grow cat grass or any kind of safe edible plants. Um, we do um, catnip and uh, thyme and wheatgrass and barley and oat and rye. We grow all kinds of different um, grasses and have seedling trays. And we can just easily rotate out the seedling trays as one starts to get squashed and sat on and chewed up, then the other one comes out and uh, yeah. we can easily rotate. So it gives the cats some, you know, chance to have those types of plant materials like they would have if they were living indoor-outdoor as well. Right. That makes sense. My cats love to chew grass. Um, yeah. It's a fun way to do it, and if they spill it, and, you know, you don't have to worry about soil all over your living room or kitchen. So it's a nice, neat place to, to put, it, put it out there. And like our catio, we have a you know, hose and everything, so we can really um, – keep everything clean and actually grow the plants and ma manage them out there too, which has worked out nicely. Yes. So do you leave your cats, or do your cats have access to that all the time or is it, you know, a couple hours a day? How does it work for you? Whenever we are home, um, whenever we are in bed at night or not home, the cats are inside. We do live in downtown Atlanta and I just, I don't live out in the burbs where, you know, there's just a lot of different people coming and going, construction people, all kinds of stuff. And who knows what could happen, cars backfiring and big trucks and scary stuff can happen out there too. So um, I always make sure that the cats are inside if they were to be, I, I don't ever let them out unattended. Okay. You know, I mean, they can be out there when I'm home. I'm not sitting out there with them, but, right. you know, not when I'm not around the house. Right. Safety One first. of the things that I've always been interested in about catios um, when it comes to exposure to other neighborhood cats, and I know that cat diseases or certain diseases um, can be sprayed with a, a hiss with saliva. So do you have a recommendation of, like, how high the screen on the outside is or so i think you're referring to feline leukemia yes um and you know that's that disease lives for about three minutes outside the body and is killed with regular soap and water um and they really need to come into contact um share food litter bowls that kind of uh, litter that kind of thing um food bowls so generally it's not going to be that casually contracted um okay. but yes i mean if you want to have it up off the floor uh maybe a couple of feet like two or three feet up high so that a cat would not be able to come up. I think the bigger issue really is um, fleas, um, heartworm disease, and then also aggression among a neighborhood cat and your cats inside their screen porch or catio. Um, now, I'm fortunate enough to have a fence around my yard, which is well within the parameters, and the catio is tucked well within. So um, generally, it keeps out a lot of wildlife as well as neighborhood cats. Um, but yeah, I'd be much more concerned about fleas and exposure to, you know, if you use any chemicals or pesticides in your yard, be mindful of that kind of stuff wafting in to the screen. Um, and then also fighting. That would be my biggest concern is neighborhood cats ticking off your indoor cats. That can happen at a window, you know, that can happen at a, at a sliding glass door. They don't have to be at a screen. So that, that's definitely a concern, and you have to know your area and your, your cats before you might offer them a, an enclosure like this. Okay. 
Is there, if I'm a cat owner and want to, I don't create a catio, is there a place that I can go either than, uh, or sorry, other than your Facebook page that shows yours that, that gives me kind of an all-encompassing idea of how to plan or what, what I need to think about before I start planning? Well, I don't know of a website that's just dedicated specifically to it, but I bet if you Google, I bet there are a lot of different um, things to, to check out. I know that I, I actually have a post uh, will be coming out soon on my website, maybe even this week, all about catios and what to consider as far as you know substrates for the flooring and, and how to build one. Um, but I think that there's probably a lot of other more detailed, actual construction-focused, detailed information that might be out there on the Internet. You just probably need to Google around a bit. Um, there is a cool product called the Perfect Fence. Now, that's not a catio per se, but it is a fencing system that you can fence in your entire yard. Um, you can do a small enclosure. You could do the whole property, whatever works for you. And um, the cats cannot scale the fence. And uh, their website is perfectfence.com. Okay. And that, that's something that might help some people get started, particularly if they're in a more rural area where they feel comfortable having their cats out, um, even if they weren't there to attend. Okay. I'll include a link to Perfect Fence, too. Um, all right. So before we get into the, the PAW Project stuff, um, did you, how would I go about finding a cat behavior consultant in my neck of the woods? or if I'm outside of the U United States? Yeah, it's, it's pretty tough. Um, I know that the IAABC.org website has a consult locator, um, or consultant locator, excuse me, um, and it, not, every, not even every state has somebody that does CAT. And I'm sure not everybody's listed on there, but everybody that's registered and certified through the organization is listed on there. And then um, you could also look for um, board certified veterinary behaviorists in your area. Um, but it is there again, fewer and farther between when it comes to behavior consultants for cats. So I think I'm actually the only person in the state of Georgia that does exactly what it is that I do, doing house calls and that kind of thing. There's some veterinarians that you bring your cat to them, um, but I think I'm the only one that does house calls in the whole state. Wow. So um, the consult locator, you, know, you put in your zip code and do a search, and a lot of people find me that way out of state. Okay. Um, so I think that's probably your best bet. Okay. Thank you. And, and I assume that you could, you know, potentially work with someone in the UK with Skype and stuff or no? Yeah, I mean, I suppose I could. I think the West Indies is the farthest. West Indies and Canada are my, my farthest consult so far. Um, but yeah, I suppose we could find a way. We just need to find a way to make the, the call not super expensive. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. So yeah, probably a Skype call would be our best bet. Okay. All right. Um, did you have anything else that you wanted to talk about as far as the certified cat behavior consultant? I don't uh, think so. I think we we covered most of that. Probably more than everyone's even interested in. I don't know. Well, I, I hope not. I, I've learned a little bit, and um, Good. as you know, I've interviewed others. So yes, I think it's been great. That's um, awesome. But yes, I, you mentioned that when we were emailing back and forth scheduling this interview, you mentioned that you wanted to talk about the PAW Project in Georgia and how you're an anti-declaw advocate. So, Yeah, I like so I, I don't know if everyone's familiar with the PAW Project, but that is a nationwide group. It was started by Dr. Jennifer Conrad in California um, years ago, but too many years ago, I should say. Um, to try to end and ban the declawing of cats in the United States. And she was successful banning it in eight cities in California. Um, but then the American Veterinary Medical Association um, lobbied to put a ban on bans. Um, so that stopped there. Um, but we are still, as a group, actively working to try to push legislation through in all the different states and cities and communities that will hear us. Um, Dr. Conrad has put together a team of directors. Uh, I don't think every state has one yet, but we're very close, and most states have at least a director and then maybe an assistant director, and that's what I am for the state of Georgia. 
Um, Dr. Stephanie Globerman of Paws, Whiskers, and Claws is the director. She's the veterinarian that I work for, and we are proudly a no-declaw facility, of course. We do offer paw repair surgery for cats that have had uh, regrowth or have been declawed incorrectly, which is extremely common, um, but we do not declaw there. And sadly, we are one of, I believe, seven, maybe eight practices now in the state of Georgia that do not do that surgery. So it's really still much more common than you think. It's still much more, um, it's, it's still offered like, you know, you want fries with that. You want, you want to declaw with your spay or neuter. Right, right. Pain meds are still often optional for a lot of spays and neuters and declaws. Um, I don't think they should ever be made an option. Um, but, yeah, declawing is one of the most painful procedures in veterinary medicine, and it's illegal in 32 other countries and now eight cities in California. And uh, also uh, Colorado, Denver, was able to pass legislation. Um, so it's really amazing to me how many people are still worried about their carpets and their sofas over their cat's health and comfort. These cats live with chronic pain, um, phantom pain, and their, their gait is forever, is forever uh, affected. Um, they have muscle atrophy in their shoulders, um, the muscles around their shoulders. They can never quite condition and get a good scratch and a tear because they can't sink their nails into a scratching post to stretch those muscles. It's, it's really just abhorrent cruelty as far as I'm concerned, and um, yet it's so commonplace as if it were no big deal, like having their teeth cleaned. Right. I am um, unfortunately experienced um, the, I don't know how to say this, the ignorance behind it um, with a friend recently who adopted a, a kitten, and um, I said, you know, when are you getting him neutered? And she's like, well, I haven't called yet, but... You know, he'll get a neuter and a declaw, and and I um, I took a deep breath and I, I said, so um, what? It's very hard not to allow, you know, the the hurt and fear which provo- provokes anger in someone um, around that when you want to be educational to that person. So what right. I tried to say was what you mentioned: the atrophy and the importance. Um, I grew up with a cat who was declawed because um, it was our family's first cat, and that's what the vet recommended. So my mom did it. It wasn't yeah. it was the 1980s. Um, and so when he passed in 2009 and I got my cats in 2009, um, I, watching them use their claws has educated me on the importance of not declawing because one of mine is belly, belly up right now um, scratching but and it's because he's excited because he knows it's meal time almost. <laughs> so um, I know it's an emotional release for them to scratch. But can you talk more about the or like how how to talk someone out of it? I guess that just saying it's hurtful and cruel, you know, I think brings on the defense. Right. So well, I always so first I always explain to them why cats scratch because if they understand why they do it and where they do it, sometimes we can get them to be a little bit more open minded to you know purchasing a, a appropriately sized and well placed scratching post and that's you know cats scratch to leave scent behind they have scent glands in their paw pads, and so again they want to scratch in socially significant high traffic areas. They scratch to get the ants out of their pants because it feels good. It's like us driving down the road with, you know, the radio blaring on a sunny day with the windows down singing our favorite song. So why would we want to take that away from them? You know, scratching is a feel-good behavior. Um, They also scratch to remove the sheaths of their nails. So they're never scratching to be malicious or vindictive. They're scratching to groom and to scent mark. So it's a normal behavior. Their, Their nails grow in layers like an onion. And they have to peel those sheaths or else the nails will grow embedded into their paw pads and, of course, give them secondary infections potentially to that. So, um, so they have to be able to, to really rip and tear down something when they're scratching. And that's why the market is sadly saturated with products that do not meet a cat's needs. D- trees and deck railings don't move. So those silly scratching posts that hang on doorknobs, throw them away. Don't buy them. There's no point. Cats don't want a scratching post that sways back and forth as they go to use it. Um, And so, and then often they're too short. They want a full body stretch when they scratch. 
So they need to be able to really reach all the way up from the tip of their front toes to the tip of their back toes, so at least 30 to 32 inches tall for a scratching post. And then again, really abrasive. So these fuzzy tufted carpeted things are useless. They don't meet the cat's needs, and it teaches them to scratch on carpet, which we don't want to do. So, you know, when I have a client that is looking to declaw, and I've had the this conversation with them and I've explained why cats scratch and how important it is to them, then I also explain to them, I I show them on my hand that, you know, we're not removing the nail. It is an amputation of the first bone of each digit. And dogs and cats bear 60% of their body weight on their front feet. So we're now asking this animal to walk on a bone that was never meant to bear body weight. And then we ask them to walk on gravel on their cat litter. In fact, after they're declawed, we ask them to walk on those yesterday's news rock-hard pellets, which is absolutely excruciating and not nice. My God, when we have a re-declaw that we have to do, we give those cats a puppy pad with shredded paper towels. We do not give them rock-hard pellets to stand on after they've had their bones amputated. It's cruel, but we do it because, or the veterinary community does it, because they don't want anything to stick to their sutures and their bandaged paws or their now unbandaged paws. So we do it for the benefit of the medicine and making sure that the cat doesn't get, you know, litter stuck on their feet. And that's not, that's not what we should be offering these cats. Not that, I mean, it shouldn't be done at all. So, you know, we wonder why these cats have litter box avoidance problems. Well, you know, if you had to stand on amputated bone and walk on the rock hard pellets of a tidy cat breeze system, do you think that you're going to be super excited about doing that? It's going to hurt. Right. And uh, then not, we're going to get sounds our, like a better choice. And then we're going to get arthritic and we're going to get old. And then we're still going to have to walk on this gravel cat litter. And we might have to walk down three flights of stairs to use our litter box. It's cruel. Yeah. So I tell people that if you're going to declaw the cat, I would rather you rehome him because you're not going to be willing to live with the behavioral repercussions of that surgery, which is going to often be using their mouth to express themselves and bite and not want to use their litter litter pan for the rest of their life because they're going to seek out soft substrates like carpet and couches and beds, something soft that doesn't hurt. And, um, yeah, and and then we're going to have a declawed cat that now has a behavior problem that's going to get dumped at the shelter. The PAW Project actually has um, not only their their Facebook page called The PAW Project, but they actually have another page called Declawed and Dumped because that's what happens to a lot of these cats. They get mutilated, and then they are either bite or they don't use their litter pan, and then they get dumped at the shelter. And they're all a victim of the uneducated human that did that to them. And I should say the veterinarian that also performed that procedure willingly that never should have. Right. Why do you suppose, this probably isn't really in line with our, our interview, but as you mentioned, there are 32 countries where it's illegal. And yes. I, I didn't know much about, you know, the whole decline world um, until I really started my website. And um, one of our, I think it was Australian followers, said, what, what's declaw mean? Um, and they were horrified so it's uh-huh. been illegal in Australia long enough that the terminology isn't even known. Um, so yeah. why, do you, why do you think it's been legal here for so long? Money. Like, why haven't we jumped on board like other countries? Money and convenience. Okay. I think a lot of veterinarians think that it will be difficult for them to be able to um, have a successful practice without offering that surgery. Um, and I've, only worked in practices that don't declaw, both of which were very, very successful. Um, And so if you practice good medicine, you will still make the money that you need to keep your practice going. Um, We don't need to do the surgery to make money. And then also convenience. People want um, basically a stuffed cat sometimes. They want this beautiful, perfect little thing. They want the litter box in the closet through a cat door that no one ever sees. They don't even want, they don't want to feed canned food because they don't want it to smell. They want the food, you know, far removed from where they spend time. They don't want to have a scratching post in their house because they think it's ugly, and they don't want their cat to ruin anything, so they declaw them. I mean, it, it's, it's not, we're not having a cat for the right reasons. We're, we're ruining what is innately a cat when we remove their nails. 
it's part of what makes them so amazing is the dexterity and their ability to move and they're so graceful and then we go and mutilate them by amputating their toes it's it's horrible um pick a different animal (laughs) don't have a cat if you have to alter the cat that much why have you chosen to share your home with the species like if you you have to learn to be able to accommodate the needs of the species you're welcoming into your house and so i i we don't we don't manipulate the species to make it work for us right you know, most people gasp when I say that, you know, dogs are declawed too, you know. And, and oh, that's horrible. Why? Why is it any worse? Pound for True. pound, it's all the same pain. But people yeah. gasp. Dogs right. are declawed. You know, when they're walking around on the upstairs apartment and they're click, 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 click on the hardwood floors and the neighbors below are complaining, well, dogs get declawed too. It's much less common, but it happens. Oh, dogs get debarked. They get their tails cropped and their ears you know, tails docked and their ears cropped. Right. They should be upset about all of these things as well. Right. I agree. All right. Well, I think uh, where I want to come from is an educational standpoint, certainly, and um, seeing the benefits of, of why, why Mother Nature gave them their claws and why they need to hold on to them. Um, right. So that and if everybody can... doesn't know, the Paw Project has a film. It's a 55-minute documentary, all about Dr. Conrad's plight to try to make this change in the United States. And it's not a horrific film, but if you love cats, it is emotional. Um, but it's not like it's you know gory and horrific. But it, it it will educate you as to what the procedure is, what types of complications these animals experience, how to fix those complications, and then last part of the film is really about pushing legislation tr- through and trying to educate. It's a great 55 minutes. If you've got the 55 minutes, watch it. It was free on Netflix for the longest time, but I yes. think you can view it now on the Paw Project site. Okay, sure. I will, I've shared it in the past several times, but I will happily share it again um, and include it in the interview. So yeah, uh, please people do. can access it quickly. Is there and anything the things, more? Yeah. I was just going to say, as far as veterinarians, if anybody's listening and is like, oh, my God, I can't possibly stop you calling at my practice, you know, um, at our practice, we actually offer nail trims free of charge to all of our clients, and we'll also teach them how to trim nails. We sell nail trimmers, the pair that we think is the best and easiest to use. Um, we have the scratching posts that you know, my husband and I make so that we can send people out the door with something successful rather than them going down to PetSmart and leaving with a rinky-dinky, terrible scratching post. Um, so we help set them up for success. And then, of course, you know, we have my services, so we can help those clients further if they're still having scratching problems despite attempting to set them up for success with the things that we offer. Um, so yeah, I think if more practices started implementing education and help for these clients, it would bond those clients to the practice and make them just as successful as offering the decal surgery. Okay, good. Good info. And if we talked about this when we spoke on the phone, and then um, I wasn't sure if you wanted it included, but uh, there is a shop portion on your website. So yeah. I, I can order one of these posts if I want to, or you said you that the, can. you've got a little supply and demand issue, so that's why I was hesitant <laughs> to bring it up. We um, have a hard time keeping up, to be honest, yes. Um, it's a good problem to have, but we, yes. you know, my, my husband Jake is a one-man show, um, so we do ask that you be patient because everything is custom-made to order. Um, one of the nice things about the scratching posts that we offer that as somebody who went to art school and has a design background and really wants my home to be aesthetically pleasing as well is that we offer a lot of colors. You know, you can get charcoal gray, you can get chocolate brown, you can get a light beige, you can get gold, you know, you can get whatever color works for your household and decor. And I think that is key to placing those posts in those prominent areas. You know, gray is my neutral, and I've got gray scratching posts all over my house, and they look fantastic. You know, you'd never know. Right. Um, But I do make um, foraging toys. Um, Sadly, I can't help anybody with the litter box cutting, but at least they've got the video. Um, But the foraging toys we can absolutely ship. And um, I guess this would be a good time for me to also – give a little plug to it. I created a whole other website separate from mine with a colleague, um, Dr. Michael Delgado, 
she and I created a website called foodpuzzlesforcats.com. And we created that because we wrote a paper, um, four of us wrote a paper that was published in the Journal of Feline Medicine and Surgery in the fall of 2016 all about feeding via food puzzles, feeding for physical and emotional well-being. And so we don't sell anything on that website at all. That website is purely education. We also don't review the food puzzles as bad or good. We review them based on skill level and just show people how, they're, how the cats manipulate them and how they work with the different puzzles. Uh, almost every toy has a video so that you can see how the cats engage with them. And you can go, oh, I think my cat can do that. He's really good with his paws. Or, oh, I think my cat could do that. He's going to push that around with his nose. Um, so it helps you kind of decide which ones are a good one to start with. And we also um, rate them as far as easy to hard. So, you know, obviously you don't want to get the most difficult food puzzle if you've never done this with your cat before. Right. So I make the puzzles on my site, and I have a few there. They're really inexpensive, but there's way more on foodpuzzlesforcats.com, and every post that we create takes you to a handy-dandy link where you can purchase one pretty easily. Okay. One of the things that my avid readers or subscribers are going to be wondering is um, I'm pretty opposed to feeding dry food only because of the repercussions of kidneys and diabetes and all that kind of stuff. Are there food puzzle options for those that feed wet and raw? There are. There is a wet food puzzles page on the site. Yep. Okay. So you can go there and check that out. They, they are, of course, a little bit more creative and harder to offer. Um, and I won't get into the food debate, but um, I am a big proponent of feeding a lot of meat, canned food. They are obligate carnivores, but I do not believe that dry food kills cats. Um, some cats won't even eat canned food. So you've got to right. feed them something. Right. And, um, yeah, I just think that the kibble should be uh, hard, to, hard to acquire and something that they work for, um, but something that they do have free access to getting when they want. Cats that are meal-fed are, are often irritable and less cooperative than cats that have free access to food. Um, I don't like to just free feed in a big, giant bowl, though, because that's not engaging and enriching, and that leads to obesity and terrible problems. So I like to free feed the cans and make them work for the dry. Got it. Okay. Well, the only other thing I kind of wanted to know was what's your favorite thing about your job and what you do? <laughs> and I guess job is a crappy question because you're very passionate. It's more your career or life calling, I'd say. But Yeah, I think, um, I think for me I've spent a lifetime – in animal welfare and in animal care, I don't eat animals, I don't wear animals, I don't buy products shoved down their throats. I try to live an ethical, animal-friendly lifestyle in every way, and I think that it's really rewarding that after all of these years, I feel like I've been screaming at the top of my lungs my whole life to get people to try to do better for animals, whether they're domestic pets or what have you. Um, and I feel like people are finally starting to listen, and that's really rewarding. I'm like, I finally have gotten to a point where people are like, oh, hey, she actually knows something. Maybe I should try that with my cat, you know? And so it's yes. just really nice to be able to make changes in so many cats' lives and also so many humans' lives. I try yes. to also make things easier for people. Right. <laughs> you know, have their house be cleaner and cool and fun and easier. So, you know, I, it's, I think it's just rewarding to know that I'm finally making an impact on so many and yes. I've wanted that for a long time. Good. Well, and in this interview today, you'll probably make an impact on very many people, so that's uh, extending it even further. I hope so. Yeah, I hope. I hope. I, I don't know how big broad your audience is, but I think it's pretty awesome that you do these interviews and, you know, help bring more awareness to the fact, even just making people aware that there are cat consultants out there. Everybody knows they can hire a dog trainer to train their dog, but not right. many people know people like I exist. And until Jackson's show, show got popular, you know, it was really, I mean, his show being on the air has made me a very busy person because um, it's just brought awareness to the profession. Yes. Yes. And I mean, to the profession and, and as well as just the education, people looking and thinking about cats in a completely different way and why Absolutely. they do what they do. Yeah. I think people are... It, the pet parent, the, particularly the cat parent these days, is definitely expecting a higher caliber of care 
and a ca higher caliber of um, education. Like the, a lot of a lot of cat parents are looking to be they're they're not just treating them like oh they're just aloof bumps on the on the sofa. You know they're realize starting to realize hey these guys need stuff to do and these guys have you know deep intellectual <laughs> you know issues that I need to understand my cat. So right. That's good. Yes. Well, is there anything more that you want to add before we sign off? No, I don't, I don't think so. You've asked a lot of great questions, and hopefully it's been very informative for, for everyone. So thank it, you for having me. You're very welcome. Thank you for doing this. And I'm sorry it took so long for us to coordinate, but um, I will get this on the site and then um, provide a link for you. It's currently March 2018, and I'm hoping to get it up by April 2018 just for those that aren't able to visually see this. That's why I wanted to say okay. that. Okay. Cool. Yeah. If you can uh, send me a link when it's when it's done, I'll share it on social media. Thank you. All right. Cool. Thank you, Ingrid, very much. You're welcome. Have a nice night. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.